Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. On behalf of the University of Chicago Law School, I'm delighted to welcome you to our spring session of the Earl B. Dickerson Centennial Conference. Thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to begin by thanking our organizers for their vision for this event and for bringing us this tremendous event. Professor Sharon Fairley, William Hubbard, and Richard McAdams, and our entire Centennial Committee, thank you for all of your efforts in the planning for today's conference. Thank you, Sharon and Richard uh, and William, especially for moving forward with this conference despite the, despite the many challenges of the pandemic. And I'm also grateful to our law school faculty and students and staff who have contributed to the planning and execution of this centennial event over the past year. Your many contributions and the contributions of all our academic colleagues for their participation today are greatly appreciated. And I want to welcome all of our attendees. It's splendid to see so many graduates. Welcome back to the law school for this event, as well as it's particularly special to welcome back all of our Dickerson Fellows. Within the law school community, many of us know something about Earl B. Dickerson's legacy. We know that Dickerson was the first African-American to earn a JD from our law school. He litigated Hansberry versus Lee before the United States Supreme Court in 1940, a case that focused on opening housing for black residents in Woodlawn and paved the way for the end of racially restricted covenants throughout the nation. His name is memorialized at the law school in several ways. Our chapter of the Black Law Students Association is named for him as our postgraduate fellowship and a student scholarship for a student committed to social justice. But there is so much more to Earl Dickerson's impact it's important for us to remind ourselves of how brave he was in becoming that first African-American JD student and the number and the magnitude of the obstacles that he overcame to obtain his education here. He was born in 1891 in Canton, Mississippi, and he came to Chicago at the age of 15. He achieved significant academic success in high school and at the University of Illinois before he came to the law school. He matriculated at the law school a mere 20 years after the Supreme Court announced the constitutionality of separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson. He matriculated at the law school nearly four decades before the first decision in Brown versus Board and a half century before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. His stays as a student here were interrupted by World War I. Despite the discrimination he experienced in his own country, he took leave from the law school and volunteered for the US Army and served in France. Upon returning to Chicago, he braved the race riots of Chicago in 1919. Despite these challenges, Earl Dickerson graduated as one of the top academic performers in the class of 1920. Upon graduating, he began an extraordinary career. Graduates of our law school tend to have careers that are varied. They could be in business, they could be in law, they can be in government service, and whatever they do, we hope they will provide some civic service. Mr. Dickerson did all four of these things. He was an exemplary litigator. We know of his important role in Hansberry versus Lee that I've just mentioned. He was also a business leader, becoming the general counsel and ultimately CEO of Supreme Life Insurance. He was also a public servant. He was an alderman in Chicago, and an appointee to the Federal Fair Employment Practices Committee. He was also highly active in the bar. For example, a leader in the Illinois State Bar Association, the Chicago Bar Association, and the National Bar Association. In many of these chapters of his career, he was the first African-American to reach that position or accomplish that feat. Mr. Dickerson set milestone after milestone. All of these roles, Mr. Dickerson not only overcame discrimination himself, he fought to eliminate discrimination for others and to make opportunities more equal for everyone. For example, as a business executive, he financed mortgages for home buyers breaking color barriers. As a Chicago alderman, he integrated the Chicago Board of Education and advocated for better housing in schools for black residents. As a political activist, he organized interracial slates of judicial candidates to challenge the all white slates that were jointly proposed by Democratic and Republican parties. As a community leader, he led the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference and the Southeast Chicago Commission, 
which promoted sustainable and integrated neighborhood development. As a homeowner, he personally reintegrated Hyde Park by moving into a home on South Drexel in 1949, becoming the first black family to live in Hyde Park since before World War I. In each of these achievements, on its own, they're remarkable. Together, they're truly extraordinary. Throughout it all, Mr. Dickerson had great faith in law and legal institutions. Given the discrimination he faced, he might well have rejected law as an instrument of oppression. And instead, he saw law as an inspiration and as a means to defeat discrimination. He worked to make the law live up to its highest aspirations and to the principles of equality, justice, and fair process. During our conference in October, legal scholars and historians explored the breadth of Mr. Dickerson's work to advance racial justice in business and government, through community activism, and the civil rights movement. Today, we reconvene with a spectacular group of lawyers, artists, activists, community leaders, and friends to reflect on his legacy. I'm delighted to start our program today with a message from the Honorable Lori E. Lightfoot, Mayor of Chicago. In addition to her public service as mayor of Chicago, Ms. Lightfoot is an accomplished lawyer and a proud graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Upon graduating, she clerked on the Michigan Supreme Court and then launched a career of extraordinary public service, both in the city and in the federal government, as well as in elite private practice. Mayor Lightfoot began her career after clerking, serving as an assistant US attorney in the Northern District of Illinois, where she led uh, investigations into large drug conspiracies, political corruption, and other matters. She served as general counsel and chief of staff to the Chicago Office of Emergency Management and Communications, and as the chief administrator in the Office of Professional Standards. As the first deputy of the Chicago Department of Procurement Services, Mayor Lightfoot transformed the city's $2 billion procurement process, reducing inefficiencies. She also revised and improved the city's minority and women-owned business certification program. Ms. Lightfoot has been a leader in police reform and accountability. She was president of the Chicago Police Board, which was a nine-member independent civilian body that decided disciplinary matters on police misconduct. Also, she served as the chair of the Police Accountability Task Force. She created the organizational structure, secured staffings, and issued reports of findings and recommendations in 2016, many of which mirrored the Department of Justice's own report in 2017. And throughout her career, Ms. Lightfoot has personally performed generous pro bono service, including service on the boards of numerous organizations, including the Better Government Association, the ACLU of Illinois, the Center for Conflict Re Resolution, and our own law school's visiting committee. Prior to her election as mayor, Ms. Lightfoot was also a senior partner in Mayor Brown where she focused on leading large complex litigations and major internal investigations. She also co-chaired that firm's diversity and inclusion committee. In 2019, Ms. Lightfoot was inaugurated as the, city's, the city of Chicago's first female black mayor and its first openly gay mayor. Although she could not join us for today's event, I'm delighted that Mayor Lightfoot could share a few words with us today as we reflect on the legacy of Earl B. Dickerson. And now we turn to a message from Mayor Lightfoot. Thank you, Dean Miles, for that introduction. I'd also like to recognize and thank Professor uh, Richard McAdams, Professor Sharon Fairley, and Professor William Hubbard for putting this event together, as well as to the Dickerson family for continuing to support this conference and keep Earl B. Dickerson's legacy alive. It's my honor to join you today to commemorate the life and accomplishments of the esteemed Earl B. Dickerson, as well as mark the 100-year anniversary since his graduation. As U of C Law School's first black JD graduate, Dickerson inspired and paved the way for so many other black lawyers, including myself. Thanks to his tireless efforts and constant push for equity, I too was able to earn my law degree from the University of Chicago and even have the privilege of serving as the president of the Black Law Students Association, as well as president of the Law Students Association. During my time at U of C, I took a stand against a firm that recruited on our campus after an incident of racism and sexism came to light. The exact kind of action Dickerson would have supported in his own time. 
and what we should all continue to do as legal professionals to prove that diversity, equity, and inclusion aren't simply buzzwords. Rather, they must be values that we fight for. Moving forward is imperative that we uphold the contributions Dickerson has made to University of Chicago Law School and to the legal field as a whole to create a better society. Though the world is very different from what it was a century ago, the cries for social justice that rippled across our country just last summer and continuing serve as a reminder that we have a long way to go before we can fully eliminate systemic inequities in areas such as housing, healthcare, and the economy, areas that Dickerson cared so deeply about. His legacy, and particularly his work related to fair housing, continues to be felt today and has even helped shape my administration's fight for equitable housing in this city. Though Dickerson's impressive career spanned across private practice, public service, and business, he maintained an unwavering focus on advancing civil rights, something that is also reflected in the past as so many U of C law graduates have taken. And the law school's core values of providing intellectual engagement and robust civil discourse and empowering graduates through transformative legal education to help them excel in a broad range of endeavors. So as each of you continue your career journeys, it's my hope and expectation that you will follow Dickerson's example and become pioneers of social change in whatever field you choose. Thank you all, enjoy the rest of today's conference, and please continue to be safe. Thank you, Mayor Lightfoot. We're incredibly grateful for your support of the Dickerson Centennial events and your continued support of our law school. Thank you for your participation today. I'm now gonna thank again and turn the program over to Professor William Hubbard. Before I do, I again want to express my gratitude to Professors Fairley, Hubbard, and McAdams, as well as all of our speakers and participants and the Dickerson family for your many, many contributions to this wonderful centennial. Now, I'm pleased to introduce Professor William Hubbard. Professor Hubbard graduated with high honors from our law school in 2000 and served as the executive editor of the Law Review. After graduating, he clerked for the Honorable Patrick Higginbotham of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and then he practiced at the firm of Mayor Brown here in Chicago. Professor Hubbard then returned to the university and obtained his PhD in economics in 2011. And then we were pleased to welcome him back to the law school as our Kaufman Legal Research Fellow and Lecturer in Law. And then the following year, he joined our faculty as Assistant Professor. Currently, Professor Hubbard serves as an editor of the Journal of Legal Studies. His research and teaching interests include civil procedure, the economic analysis of litigation in courts, and education and labor economics. Thank you, William. Thank you, Professor Hubbard, for your leadership in organizing today's centennial. I'm delighted to turn the program over to you. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you, Dean Miles, uh, for your remarks. And thank you to Mayor Lightfoot for sharing uh, words with us today. I also want to thank Professor uh, Richard McAdams, Professor Sharon Fairley, as well as Adam Hassanane and Ariel Yoon, who served as the student members of our Centennial Committee. I've had the pleasure and the honor of working uh, with all of you over the past uh, two years to organize this conference and to commemorate such an important part of the history of the law school of Chicago and of American law. As Dean Miles mentioned, uh, part one of our conference took place in October. Uh, that conference brought together historians and law professors who discussed Earl Dickerson's contributions as a business person, as a civil rights movement lawyer, and as a community and political leader here in Chicago and for the nation. I want to express my gratitude to the participants in that fall conference. Our speakers included Emily Aguirre, Rick Brooks, Carol Rose, Sherrod Thaxton, David Strauss, Tinu Adederan, Dylan Penegraff, Chris Schmidt, Latoya Baldwin-Clark, Ken Mack, and Sean Ose Owusu. I want to also note for all of you here today that for anyone interested, that conference that was recorded and all of their talks are available on the law school's uh, website. Now, before I introduce our first panel, I'd like to offer a, a 
personal and professional note about the significance of Earl Dickerson to my field of law. As Dean Miles mentioned, I teach civil procedure and Earl Dickerson has special significance in the history of civil procedure. He led the legal team that won the landmark case, Hansberry versus Lee, as Dean Miles mentioned. This case struck down a racially restrictive covenant in a neighborhood not far from the University of Chicago Law School. This racially restrictive covenant prevented blacks from owning or moving into houses in what is now known as part of the Woodlawn neighborhood. Now, in challenging these racial restrictions in the Supreme Court of the United States, Earl Dickerson led a legal team that included several other University of Chicago law graduates. I'd like to, I'd like to, to note that, uh, including Irvin Mollison, Truman Gibson, and Loring Moore. These lawyers faced an enormous challenge. They were challenging an agreement to exclude Blacks from a neighborhood at a time when the notorious separate but equal doctrine was the law of the land. How did they do it? How did they win? They won through the ingenious use of arguments about court procedure. Now, I promise I will spare you the legal details, um, but in winning the case, Earl Dickerson and his legal team not only convinced the court to strike down a racially restrictive covenant, but the court also announced principles of procedural law that would later become foundational for legal reforms that would help empower civil rights litigation for decades, starting in the 1960s right up through to today. So I want to note that this celebration marks not only the 100th anniversary of Earl Dickerson's graduation from the University of Chicago Law School in 1920, but also the 80th anniversary of his victory in the Supreme Court in Hansberry versus Lee in 1940. Now we'll hear more about the Hansberry case uh, later in our program. Uh, I just will note now that the, the plaintiff in that case was Carl Hansberry, a Chicago business person, and the father of the great American playwright, Lorraine Hansberry. To commemorate the anniversary of Hansberry versus Lee, we are so pleased and grateful to have actors from Court Theater who will be reading scenes from her groundbreaking play, A Raisin in the Sun. Now, I want to note, of course, the date, it's 2021, so it's not exactly 100 years, it's not exactly 80 years since these great milestones. The celebration that we're having today was delayed by a year due to the effects of the global pandemic, which of course we're all still going through. I mention this because in this respect, it actually makes the anniversary that we're celebrating, uh, Earl Dickerson's graduation, even more relevant to us today. It's sobering, but I think it's important to acknowledge the parallels between then and now. Earl Dickerson's time as a student at the University of Chicago Law School was interrupted by bloody conflict overseas, by riots and outright racial violence against blacks in the United States and right here in Chicago. And yes, even a global pandemic. For him, it was the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919. Earl Dickerson's life, his example, and his legacy are as relevant today as ever. Now, speaking of Earl Dickerson's legacy, there is a part of his legacy that right now I, I want to make sure I take a moment uh, to acknowledge, and that is his family. I have had the honor of, of meeting uh, in person and remotely um, uh, Earl Dickerson's grandchildren, Steve Brown, Josh Cohen, and Judy Cohen. And on behalf of myself and, and everyone at the law school, I thank them so much for their support, for their participation in these events, uh, celebrating Earl Dickerson, and for sharing their memories of Earl Dickerson and uh, in particular, I'll add their, their family photographs, uh, some of which you see displayed uh, uh, during this conference and, and in fact, during uh, these comments that I'm offering right now. Uh, and Steve Brown, I will note, is also joining us as a panelist on our first panel. Now, this brings me to uh, our panels for today. 
I am so thrilled, so happy that all of our panelists are here today. And I am, I, I can't even say how grateful I am uh, for our panelists who have been extraordinarily uh, flexible uh, with their time and with the format of this conference as all of us have weathered uh, the pandemic and adapted uh, to the circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in for this conference.